where you are. All right, welcome everybody. We are, hard to believe, on week 37. Can you believe we've been uh, meeting 37 weeks going back to September? It's, it's been great. You guys are wonderful, and uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed it. So tonight we're going to look at the letters by apostles, okay? Not the Apostle Paul or the Apostle, well, James wasn't an apostle. We don't know who wrote Hebrews, but these are Peter and John who were two of Jesus' closest apostles. Remember, he took Peter, James, and John. James and John were twins, or not twins, but brothers. And he took them everywhere. They took them deeper into the Garden of Gethsemane. He took only them up to the uh, Mount of Transfiguration. And so here are, here are letters from two Jesus, two of his closest apostles, as we look. And then Jude was Jesus' half-brother. So we're going to look at these six books tonight. Now, three of them are only one chapter long. Second John, Third John, Jude, just not even divided up because they're so short. And uh, so we'll spend most of our time in First and Second Peter and then in First John. So let's have a word of prayer together as we begin. Thank you, Father, for giving us your word, for revealing yourself to us in so many ways in creation, ultimately in Jesus, and uh, then in the written word that we have today that we can uh, dissect and learn and grow by. Thank you so much for it. Teach us tonight through these books by other apostles. I pray for your Holy Spirit's leading, guiding, illumination of your word so that we can see it and understand it and grow by it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, very good. Uh, let's have a quick little uh, quiz to review the stages. Since we've only got a couple weeks left, let's have a look. So what are the stages? Let's do them all, and then we'll see if we can do the sub-points, right? Stages, ready? S, here with me, one, two, three, go. Starting, treaties and tribes, advancement, glory, erosion, and servitude, right? Okay, what are the four events in starting? Do you remember? We got creation, fall, flood, and Babel, right? Creation of everything, the fall of mankind into sin, the flood, Noah, and the power of Babel. So, so starting, treaties and tribes. Who are the four men in the treaties and tribes? We got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. All right. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are considered the patriarchs, the patriarchs. And then Joseph, of course, we follow him to Egypt where God sent him. Kind of a bit of a rough road uh, to save the world. All right, starting, treaties and tribes, advancement. Uh, what are the four events in advancement? We've got exiting Egypt, wilderness wandering, conquering Canaan, and Jewish judges. All right, and that's a period of, uh, between Joseph and Moses, you know, we've got a period of several hundred years while the Israelites are growing from 70, remember, Jacob and the whole family, 70 people to, well, it says 600,000 men, plus the women and children, so maybe a couple of million people as they leave Egypt under Moses, advancement, and water in the wilderness, and then conquering Canaan under Joshua, and then the time of the judges. All right, and then the G... When the judges are finished, we get to 1 Samuel chapter 8, and the people come to Samuel and say, we want you to give us a king so that we can be like all the other nations. And uh, God says, it's not you they're rejecting, but me, Samuel. And so they have three kings in the stage of glory. Who are they? Saul, David, and Solomon. Yeah, exactly. And Solomon, boy, he goes so downhill. I mean, he's building altars at, you know, to other gods for the wives that he's got. 700 wives, 300 more concubines. His son is messed up because his son is like from the, um, the princess of, I think, uh, the Ammonites. That's Solomon's wife. And so Rehoboam messes things up. We have the stage of erosion. Three things happen then. What? Israel divides, and then we've got the fall of the northern kingdom in 722 B.C., and then the fall of the southern kingdom in 586 B.C. 
So it's quite an erosion from this, the peak of glory under Saul, David and Solomon, downhill it goes. And, uh, and then we have finally, and at the end of that, they're all taken away into servitude, right? Stage of servitude. Three waves, they're carried off to Babylon, and then they come back in three waves under who? Zerubbabel, then the priest named Ezra, and then the cupbearer Nehemiah. Very good. Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah. Zen. They didn't find any Zen, but uh, three guys are Zen, if you will. Okay, good. Uh, then we've got the incarnate with the New Testament, right? The life of Jesus, at least. And in the incarnation, uh, there were three W's, or three V's, sorry. What were they? Do you remember? Got virgin birth, visited by shepherds, and veneration in the temple with Simeon and Anna. And then you've got the stage of nothing for 30, that was 40 days long. Then the stage of nothing for the first 30 years, and all we see is three W's, what? Worshipped by Magi, then he wows the teachers at 12 years old when he comes there for his bar mitzvah, and then, where is he? Right? Where is he for the next, uh, well, till he's 30, and he's old enough to be recognized as a teacher, a rabbi. All right? Then confirmation, the first year of Jesus' ministry. How is it, how is Jesus externally confirmed that he is the Messiah? By God and his baptism, good, I see some of your lips going, by Satan at his temptations, good, and then by nature at his first miracle, all right, good, good. The second stage, or the second year of Jesus' earthly ministry is the stage of affirmation, three A's, it's affirmed as he, what, uh, his awesome power, his authoritative teaching, and he appoints apostles, right? And then the next three stages are just six months each. The stage of rejection, where is he rejected? He's rejected at Nazareth, right, his hometown. He's rejected by the church leaders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the, even the Samaritans in their own religion. And then he's rejected by many followers, after he, in John 6, after he feeds the 5,000, you know, men plus women and children, and, and then he says, unless you eat my flesh, you know, I am the bread of life. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And like, by the end of chapter 6 of John, they're all going, whoa, this is hard. What does this mean? And many leave and don't follow him anymore. The next six months are the stage of notification. Three T's, what are they? Thou art the Christ says Peter, the son of the living God. And then there is the transfiguration when he takes Peter, James, and John up onto the mountain of transfiguration, maybe Mount Tabor, but uh, takes them up on the top of that mountain and, and kind of like Superman, you know, pulls away on the outside and he shines, glows like lightning and shows them his, his glory, I think is what it is. And then he sends out the 72. And so the 72 go, and they are, they're doing miracles, they're casting out demons, it's amazing stuff, and they come back and say, Lord, even the demons listen to us in your name! And Jesus says, yeah, yeah, that's great, never mind that. What's best is that your names are written down in heaven. Your salvation is way more important than any kind of, you know, fancy anything on earth, so... All right, and then there's the stage of antagonism, the last six months before Jesus goes to the cross. And we have, what do we have? Uh, I can't get them in the right order. He angers church leaders, okay, yeah, by the things he says. Arise Lazarus. Is that first? Arise Lazarus. Then he angers church leaders, and then he's anointed by Mary. And actually, Arise Lazarus, and then anointed by Lazarus' sister Mary, they just happened in the last couple weeks before Jesus um, goes to the cross, before the Passion Week. As a matter of fact, the place where Jesus is a, has his feet anointed by Mary and their, you know, her perfume was that was just a party that they were selling, ready for Jesus because he raised Lazarus, the brother, from the dead. And then it's just five days later, that's uh, the day of Passover and preparation, we're told. 
So that's the Passion Week then that happens. Five events, five teas. You got the triumphal entry there, probably on the Sunday. We call it Palm Sunday. You've got the temple cleansing, maybe later that day or Monday. You got the toughest teaching happening throughout that week where he just zeroes in on the on the church leaders who should know better. They should be leading people to God, but no, no, they're calm. Jesus. Jesus' words for them, like uh, we would tell our kids, don't talk like that, because he calls them sons of hell, hypocrites, blind guides, that, that they, are, they are like empty graves, you know, look good on the outside, but they're dead on the inside. Wow, leading people astray. So tough teaching. And then you've got the Last Supper. On If we're going to go with a Wednesday crucifixion, which gives us the three special Sabbaths, you know, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Saturday Sabbath, then that would be like Tuesday night, you know, and the day of preparation for the Passover would start, and Jesus would have the meal, the Last Supper, and then the next day, the crucifixion, probably nine in the morning, and by noon, things all go dark, and by three o'clock, he dies, earthquake, and uh, before sundown, when the Passover itself starts, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus get permission to get his body and bury it. And three days later, we've got exaltation, Easter, empty tomb, up from the grave he arose, and it's great. And then uh, there are 11 appearances during the last stage, exaltation, 40 days, right? 40 days, 11 appearances in the Bible, many more probably, and then elevated. Up he goes, the ascension into heaven, where Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father today. Okay? So I hope you all memorized all that I just said there, because you're each... I'm going to pair you up, and you'll each... <laughs> yeah, when, 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 when you've been doing it for uh, a whole lifetime like me, and uh, teaching this probably 30, 30 times, then uh, you'll know it like that too. All right, very good. Uh, the report, if, if the stages go from creation to Christ, starting treaties and tribes, same with me, ready, one, two, three, starting treaties and tribes, advancement, glory, erosion, and servitude, all right, then report goes from Christ to today, I didn't ask you to memorize these, so don't worry about it, you've got redemption, it's the life of Christ, then the early church days, the first uh, uh, 11, 12 chapters of the book of Acts, then Paul's ministry, the rest of the book of Acts, plus his letters. And then you've got one church, the one Catholic. The word Catholic means universal. So there was the one universal church up to about 1500. Then you have Reformation and Revival, uh, the Protestant Reformation, the Revivals, the Great Awakenings. And then today, we're calling the last couple of hundred years uh, with the expansion, really, of lots of missions and all kinds of stuff. Okay. Good, there's a review. One more thing to review before we start looking at these books, how the New Testament is put together. And you'll recall there are three kinds of books. We've got the history books, right? And they are the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels. And then the book of Acts is a history book too. Now these are all at the beginning of your workbook, but just a quick reminder, we studied those Five, six weeks actually in Jesus' life, and then two weeks in the book of Acts. And then we finished up, well, we're finishing tonight the 21 letters that were written. 13 written by Paul. Two, we saw last week, written to Jewish believers, Hebrews and James. And then six by other apostles we're going to look at tonight. And then next week, we will look at the prophecy. So we've got history letters, history and letters and prophecy and uh, the big prophecy book, of course, in the New Testament is the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And again, it's the Revelation, no S. It's not Revelations, it's the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, good. Is that enough review? Yeah. All right. Uh, a couple quick questions from your uh, reading and uh, your homework. Uh, let's hear a couple people. How would you rewrite 1 Peter 2, 20 and 21 in your own words? 1 Peter 2, 20 and 21. A couple people want to share what you wrote? Well, if you, uh, if you want to 
want to be a good Christian, you should be um, doing and acting like Christ did. Excellent. It includes, it includes suffering. Yeah, he suffered, right? Yeah, it does. Okay, good. Somebody else? Who's next? Another person. Sandy, the only one brave enough to share. One more person. Who wants to share what they wrote down? I can. Thank you. Um, I wrote, Christ suffered for us, so we should suffer for him by doing right. Perfect. All right. Good, good. All right. Thank you so much. Um, let's jump to uh, 1 John chapter... Uh, 2 verses 1 to 6. What is said about the person who really knows Christ as their Lord? Somebody else? They walk like Jesus. Yeah. They walk like Jesus. They live like Jesus. Very good. Okay, let's, uh, let's jump into, so we've got six books to look at, let's just jump right into them here right away, if you will. So there are some common things in these last six letters. Okay, last six letters, we call them books in the Bible, which they are, but they're written initially as letters. So several things here. First, they are written by apostles. Okay, so Peter and John, as I mentioned before, are in the inner circle with John's brother James that uh, saw things and heard things that the other apostles didn't. Um, so Peter and James. And the other, um, the other is the book of Jude, which is Jesus' half-brother. He wasn't an apostle, uh, but uh, we include his book here because it fits best here. Number two, uh, these books all include warnings against false teachings. Uh, false teaching has crept up into the church, and so there's lots of uh, that coming around. Some of it included what we looked at in Colossians a few weeks ago, you know, like real humanism and asceticism and docetism and legalism, like a lot of that was creeping up. We've talked a lot about the legalism, right? Following, you have to follow the Jewish law, circumcision, all that. Uh, but these other things were creeping up as well. And we're going to see in 1 John today, we're going to see that uh, there was another one called Gnosticism. So all of them talk against false teachers. All right, number three. They were all written that you may know that Jesus is the Christ. These guys, they saw Jesus. They, Peter and John, they, they walked with Jesus for three and a half years, and they saw and heard him uh, alive, and after his resurrection, you know, like... They were there, eating with him and spending time with him. Saw him alive on multiple occasions. Now, if you have your Bible, here's the first verse we're going to look up. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. And then we'll go back to uh, 1 Peter here in a moment. But 1 John chapter 5 for now. Okay, everybody there? 1 John 5, and look at verse 13. John says, I write these things to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Wow! Seriously, I don't know how many people I've spoken to over the years who I'll say, do you know, do you know that you'd go to heaven if you died? Or do you know that, you know, and like all kinds of people say, well, I don't know. Well, can anybody know? Nobody can know for sure. Stuff like that. No, you can. You can. The Bible was written so that you can know that you have eternal life in Jesus, that you can go to heaven. And that's what John says right here. I write these things to you, but not everybody, you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So that's one of the reasons why they're there in all books. They're, all of these books are uh, confirming Jesus is the Christ. Number four, these were all written to suffering Christians, especially the two letters of Peter, but really all six of them, the church was suffering, and mostly it was persecution that was happening. And uh, so all of those things were going on. This is part of the great persecution, the great persecution that uh, had gone out against Christians. All right, 
Let's fill in the chart at the bottom of page 151. You have your workbook there, 151. And uh, let's talk about 1 Peter first. The theme of 1 Peter, Peter's first letter, is comfort, comfort for suffering Christians. Again, the believers were suffering, and Peter himself was suffering. Uh, this is 1 Peter, but 2 Peter probably just before he dies. Tradition tells us Peter dies being crucified, and when they went to crucify him, Peter said, no, 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 I'm not worthy to die the same way as my Lord Jesus. And so the Romans, for sport, I guess, the tradition says they crucified him upside down. So they wanted to crucify him, and they did, but since he didn't want to be crucified the same way as Jesus, they said, fine, and we'll crucify you upside down. Wow. So that's, what, that's not in the Bible, but tradition says that. And the key verses are 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 13, which say, hey, is there a volunteer that would like to read this? There, we'll have a bunch of volunteers tonight, but who wants to be the first to read this first one? It's on the screen. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. Volunteer? I can do it. All right. Go ahead, Kathy, and then Lex will have you read the next one. Okay. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the suffering of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. So that's the... That's the theme, the key verse of 1 Peter. And as you can see, it's about suffering. <laughs> and I don't like it, really. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come on you as though something strange are going to happen. Yikes! Paul says in one of his letters, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So persecution shouldn't be a surprise to us if we're standing up for the Lord. If we're not, if we're some secret Christian, nobody knows, and you know, yeah, yeah, maybe we won't be persecuted then, but what will Jesus say to us one day? You know, were you ashamed of me? As a matter of fact, um, is it Matthew that says, those who are ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of before my Father in heaven. Those who won't acknowledge me, I won't acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Oh my goodness. So we gotta be careful about that, right? All right, let's go on with the boxes. The key word is suffer 15 times and glory 16 times. Again, I like how glory beats suffering. So in, in just the few chapters here, uh, you find the word suffering 15 times because that's what it's about. But if we stand up under suffering, you know, then we will see God's glory and uh, be glorified. So that's beautiful. And the date is about 63 AD. So it's similar to many of Paul's letters that we have seen. 63 AD, um, yeah, so it's a little later, it's like maybe 30 years after Jesus has uh, died and risen and gone back to heaven, so the church has been growing and expanding and all of the book of Acts and the letters of Paul, and, and so that's the time when, when basically the gospels are written, except John, which is later, and these letters are mostly written too. All right, let's talk about 2 Peter, okay? 2 Peter's theme is warning against false teachers. Okay? Now, there's still suffering going on, and you see that in this letter. And indeed, we believe that 2 Peter is a letter that Paul wrote just before he was killed by the Romans. Again, tradition says, crucified upside down, just like 2 Timothy was written by Paul just before he went and we believe he was beheaded by the Romans. Second Peter, we believe, is Peter's last letter shortly before he went to, uh, to die. The key verse is 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. And uh, Lex, would you read this for us? Sure. But there are also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Mm. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them swift destruction on themselves. Okay, thank you, Lex. Yeah, so there's the idea. False prophets are coming, and just like in the Old Testament there were false prophets, there are also false prophets coming today, in that day, and still around today. 
some of the stuff. There's a guy, this is just one example. There's a guy over in Asia and speaks several different languages, very well spoken and has become very, very popular. But basically his teaching is that it's a teaching called extreme grace, which says basically you can just do anything you want because God's grace will cover it. What? Yeah, go ahead. You can sin, you know, like if, you know, it's a bit of an accident, maybe God's grace will just cover it. You know, don't, don't worry, do whatever, just God's grace will cover it. But wait a minute, no. No, God gives us the Holy Spirit so that we won't sin anymore. So God's not okay with just saying, yeah, I'll sin and Jesus died for it. Yeah, I don't think we should uh, presume on the grace of God. There's a song you guys wouldn't know from way back 30 years ago by a Christian singer that says, God's grace was not designed as a rug to wipe your feet. Wow. No, not at all. Not at all. Okay. Uh, the key word is knowledge. Six times. Again, it's just a short little book. And uh, what is the antidote to false teaching? The proper teaching. Having proper knowledge. Knowing who Jesus is and what he did and where salvation comes from. You know, trust in Jesus. If you have that knowledge, you can defeat uh, false teachers. All right, and the date 66 AD, again, so maybe a couple of years later after 1 Peter was written, and again, just before Peter dies, we believe. All right, so let's look at some highlights first of uh, 1 Peter, and then we'll look at highlights of 2 Peter. All right, so 1 Peter, again, the theme is about suffering and uh, standing up under suffering, comfort for suffering Christians. And so Paul, Peter talks about how to deal with suffering, which again is one of the major themes of the book. We're on page 152 in your workbook if you've got that. So one of the major themes of this book. So let me read these passages while you write them down. So three things Peter says. How do you deal with suffering? Number one, bear it patiently to follow Christ's example. So Peter says in 1 Peter 2... 20 to 24, he says this. Uh, how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and you endure that? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And then there's a quote from Isaiah. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And then here's a great verse to mark in your Bible if you're walking along with me. Uh, 1 Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So great stuff. So number one, how do you deal with suffering? You bear it patiently following Christ's examples. Jesus didn't threaten, you know, and he, no, and neither should we. Number two, he says, Peter says here, you should understand that your suffering, as you bear it patiently, will produce positive results in you. So chapter 5, verse 10. He says, and the grace and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Isn't that great? Yeah. So God's doing a work. He's making you stronger and more firm and steadfast as you endure, indeed bear it patiently. And then the third thing, a couple different places back in chapter 1, you, we can understand that our suffering will bring praise to God. And that will be a help to us. Uh, verse 7 says, These sufferings have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though it's refined by fire, your faith may be proved genuine and may, be, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Well, that's great. When we go through trials, he says, it's like gold going through the fire of purification. And all the bad comes out of it. And with the gold, it's called the dross. 
and the gold is more pure, and our faith is more pure when we go through, when, again, we bear it patiently and go through trials, and God is glorified. And then uh, 4.13 says, Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. All right. Good, so that's one of the big things. Peter's letter, first letter especially, is about suffering. Here's how you can endure it, Peter says uh, throughout his book. All right, number two. Uh, and this fits with our Sunday series right now as we are in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and submission. We all submit to Christ. We are all to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And, and submission of wives, submission of husbands, submission of children... And so Peter, again, talks about this as well in chapter 2. Okay, chapter 2. So if you've got your Bible there, 2 Peter, or 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2, 13, Peter says this, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. Ah, why again? Paul said to the Ephesians, submit as to the Lord. And so here Peter says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority, or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong, and to commend those who do right. For it's God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone, love the brotherhood of believers, fear God, honor the king. Wow. Okay, so a couple of things he's saying here. A few lessons. One, he's saying that God has put all authorities in their place and has given them the authority that they have now. Even if they decide that school stays closed till September. Regardless, that God has put them in place and we need to uh, be um, submit yourselves, he says, to them. And we saw Paul talked about this. Now this says Romans 13 as well. And in Romans 13, Paul says that God's put them in place so that we can live quiet and peaceful lives and lives of order and uh, with the governing authorities. Here's the second thing that Peter says. The governing authorities have the right to punish those who don't obey them. Yeah, I don't like that. I don't like a, a speeding ticket and a fine if I'm going too fast or have a rolling stop or... You know, all the other things. Park in the wrong place so they can't plow the street. You know, there are a million things, right? Ultimately, God says they've had, they're there for our good. And we didn't listen. Everybody got that? All right, let's go on. Number three, Peter says, When we obey the authorities, we are obeying God, and therefore giving a testimony of our faith. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or the governors that he sends. Yeah. So we're obeying God, and that is a testimony. You know that. It's what it says. All righty, number four. Uh, submission to the authorities over us. Now, by the way, I didn't keep reading, but it goes on to talk about uh, servants and masters. And uh, so when we, again, when we are submissive where we need to, to the authorities above us, whether it's the governor or the king or the, our master, whoever that might be, the boss at work, you know, again, it's a testimony. It keeps our consciences clear when we obey authorities and the laws of our government. And uh, some of this here in First Peter two, and some of it's in uh, back in Romans chapter seven too. Let Let me read part of this. Uh, um, Servants, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? We read this before. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. All right. 
And I have one more, I think. Yeah, it's right to pay taxes. This is back in the Romans passage we didn't read because they are part of having the blessings of a nation. And nobody likes paying taxes, but I do like having my garbage picked up in front of my house. <laughs> I don't like paying taxes, but I like that if you know, someone's breaking into my car or my house, I can call 911 and the, you know, the police will come. And so there are lots of benefits for sure. And uh, yeah. Now I will say in the Bible, you know, like 10% was the maximum taxes, and I would vote for that again. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> Everybody just give 10%, and then we're all good. Yeah, not the way it works. All right. Good, good. So that's another thing, another highlight of Peter. Submission where it is called for, and it honors God, and keeps our consciences clear, all the things that we just saw. And again, it's interesting, because we're just looking that, at that on Sundays. We looked at it, if you missed it, last Sunday, we looked at what God said about wives, and this Sunday we'll look at husbands, and, uh, and don't, don't only watch one. You gotta you got watch them both. <laughs> all right, very good. Uh, another lesson uh, on the same principle, he moves from chapter 2 to chapter 3 and does talk about husbands and wives. And uh, let's just read that. Got your Bible there, the first seven verses? 1 Peter 3. And, uh, and we, uh, we quoted this last Sunday, you'll remember. In church, wives in the same way be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands like Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. And then husbands, in the same way, be considerate with your life as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner as heirs with you of the precious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Ooh. We'll talk about that on Sunday, too. Husband's not treating his wife right. God won't answer his prayers. Wow. How do you treat her right? Consideration, respect, and, of course, what we'll look at Sunday from uh, Ephesians 5. Love your wife in the same way that Christ loved the church. How? By giving himself up for her. So, husbands, our, our, our role is actually bigger we are to have sacrificial love, sacrificial love for our wives. So, my goodness. So what are some of the principles? Well, there's a lot here. I think uh, just jot down whatever you want on what we just read here, one or two things, if you like. There's not a list on the screen is what I'm telling you. So, uh, our attitudes are more important than our actions, although obviously actions count too. For a, a woman, uh, beauty of your inner self, purity and reverence, and for your man, the consideration that you have for your wife as an heir with you of the gracious gifts of, gift of life. And God blesses when we uh, approach our spouse properly with love and respect. And wow, this one is scary too. If you're not considerate to your wife and uh, loving toward your wife, your prayers will be hindered, Peter tells us here. Goodness, I need to run right home and repent. No, I think Lynette and I are good. I checked with her before I left. We're all good. All right, let's move on. Let's move on to 2 Peter, okay? Again, 2 Peter, 1 Peter written about 63 AD, 2 Peter about 66 AD, just before Peter dies perhaps upside down on a cross. That's what tradition tells us. So let's turn to 2 Peter and look at the ad twos. Say what? The ad twos? Well, I would have read this for tonight. Uh, the bottom of page 152. Uh, let's read together 2 Peter 1, 5 to 9. Okay, ready? Chapter 5. Everybody with me? Follow along. Here we go. 
For this very reason, says Peter, make every effort to add to, ready? So jot these down in your notes as you follow along if you want. Add to your faith goodness. So where does it start? It starts with faith. Okay, it's your faith in Jesus, your faith in God, and Jesus dying too. And add to that goodness, right? On top of faith, add to that goodness, and uh, which is your life, you know, a good life. Because Jesus died for you, you need to show it to others. And add to goodness, knowledge. All right, you need to learn more and more of what God teaches you and what Jesus is like. And then add to your knowledge, self-control. There's the next one, self-control. Okay, as you're learning more and more about what God wants in the area of goodness and becoming more like Jesus, that there's going to be self-control so that you're living like Jesus and not like your, your sinful nature would want. And self-control and perseverance. Perseverance. P-E-R-S-E-V-E-R-A-N-C-E. -E -E. I spell the ones that I'm, you know, think I would misspell myself here. Add to that perseverance. Keep it up. Keep it up. You you got faith in God, and you're being good, and you're learning more about Jesus, and you're having self-control to do it. Keep it up. Persevere in these things. And to perseverance, godliness. Okay? You're becoming more and more like Jesus, godliness. And to godliness, add brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, here's the top of the heap, love. Add to those things. That's quite a list, right? But I love how verse 8 goes, because listen to this. Verse 8 says, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure. Okay, so all these things, you're growing in them, right? If they're increasing in your life, listen to this. They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's reverse those. If I'm growing in those, all those areas, I will be positively, I'll be what? Effective and productive, right? Because if I'm not, I'm ineffective and unproductive. And then verse 9. But if anyone does not have them, he's nearsighted and blind. And he has forsaken, he has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. God's forgiven you of your sins. Great! You put in, put in your faith in Jesus to forgive your sins. Now add to all that stuff, right? Add to that your goodness and the knowledge and self-control and a brotherly kindness and love. You're adding all those things. And if, you're, if these are growing in your life, you'll be effective, you'll be productive, and that's great. And if not, if you're not growing these things in your life, then you're blind, you know? You're, it's short-sighted. There's the long view of what God wants for you. And you've forgotten that Jesus died for your sins. My goodness. Okay, good. So a couple of things here. What are they? Well, you've already written them down. What's the importance of this? What do you think the importance of this list is? Or let me ask you this. What does this list remind you of? This list is from Peter. What does it remind you of? Love, self-control, kindness. Fruit of the Spirit. Exactly, yeah. Paul calls them the fruit of the Spirit, and his list is very similar to uh, Peter's list here, which we're calling the add-tos, you know, add to faith, goodness, and, and on and on. So it's, it's a similar thing, it's, and they should be growing, just like the fruit of the Spirit should be growing in our lives as well. Okay, good, good. All right, uh, note, again, it says, these qualities are to be possessed in increasing measure, which means they should always be growing. Again, you could just, you know, jot these down to, they should always be growing, it's fine. All right, and like Peter said, they will keep us from being ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge, our knowledge of God will be effective in learning and growing and living out what we're learning and effective in our lives as spouses, as parents, as uh, co-workers with other people, just in every area, we'll be more effective if, if 
these things, like the fruit of the Spirit, similar, are growing in our lives. All right. And again, Peter stresses the importance of knowledge if we want to be able to stay away from the teachings of false teachers. Knowledge is in the middle of the list and knowledge is at the end. You know, being effective and productive in our knowledge. All right. As they teach, I'm told that uh, in the banks, you know, and there's less and less currency floating around these days as people use electronic funds and stuff, but uh, they teach, they teach, every once in a while they teach, watch for this or this on these counterfeit bills when a new one comes around, but generally they teach them what to look for on the genuine bill so that, that when that is missing or different, then you know the counterfeit. And it's the same thing. Like, we need to know what proper faith is, what uh, proper theology is, and then we can recognize when improper comes around, when false teaching right. comes around. Yep. Can I ask a question? Yes, you may. Um, would you consider um, teaching in prosperity a false teaching? Sandy, thank you for asking that. That is a huge question. Oh. That, no, no, it's, it's a good question, and it's a huge question, because what's called the prosperity gospel is being preached, and many of these people are ones you see on TV, and some of them, they have these big churches, and they have wonderful worship bands who are writing songs that people sing all over the world, and uh, when they tune in, they're getting this prosperity gospel. Now, if some of you don't know what the prosperity gospel is, it's... It teaches you that, basically, if you have enough faith and there is no sin in your life, then you will always be healthy, you will never be sick, and, and you will live till one day God takes you home in your sleep, you know, when you're like, you know, 90 years old, because you'll never be sick. And if you are sick, it's your own fault, because there must be sin in your life. It's your own fault, because you don't have enough faith. And, and not just healthy, but wealthy. Wealthy. That if you, if you again, have enough faith and you're, there's no sin in your life, then God will just bless you fantastically with wealth. And as a matter of fact, if you're working for somebody else, you should quit that job because you get a salary and that's limiting how much God can bless you. So you should start your own business Everybody, yes, you should start your own business so that there's no limit on how much God can bless you. And of course, that is not biblical. Yes, there were guys like Job and Abraham who were very, very wealthy, and God does say that was his blessing on them. But frankly, when I, got a, when I get a raise, I consider it God's blessing. You know, when you get a new job, you consider it God's blessing. But that's the problem here, because Jesus doesn't say every Christian will be wealthy. Or that every Christian will be healthy, completely, never sick. Um, indeed, what does Jesus say? If you want to follow me, you must take up your, what? Cross daily and follow me. Yeah. So, so here's, here's another one of the dangers of this prosperity gospel, or the health and wealth gospel, if you will. Uh, Lynette and I know several couples who really got deep into this and joining with these kind of groups. And the one couple uh, were pregnant and uh, they lost their child. And the people from their church who taught this basically came to them and said, oh, we're so sorry for you, we're so sad for you, but you wouldn't have lost this child if you'd have been in the Word more. Because, because, because with the prosperity gospel, if you're sick, it's your fault. Either you don't have enough faith or there's some sin in your life. This sounds like Job's friends, right? You're a hypocrite, Job. There has to be sin in your life. And so that's the thing. So we, we yeah, it is, it, is, it is a false teaching. You know, there's nowhere where you uh, take up your cross and follow Jesus. Or how about all these? What's the whole book of uh, First Peter about? Suffering. Stand up under suffering. You will suffer. 
So anyway, that was probably too long, but I, that was an important, that's an, that's an important question, yeah. And we all need to know this stuff, right? We all, do we pray for God's blessing? Yes. Do we want it to be physically? Yes. Frankly, most of the prayers we pray are for, you know, Bobby who's sick and John with cancer and Susie who, you know, lost her job. Aren't those our prayers usually? So, so yes, we can pray for these things, and we should. But we still live on a cursed planet. A cursed planet where there is sickness and disease, you know, on this planet that until Jesus comes back, I mean, Paul says in Romans 8, right, that the, the, all creation groans, longing, longing for Jesus to come and redeem it. You know, and our bodies groan, longing for Jesus to come and give us the new body, which we've talked about plenty. So, yeah. So the prosperity gospel is, is, I believe, genuinely a false teaching. And one of the biggest ones today. Yep. And, and with that, I'm going way too long on this, with that you have people who manipulate with that, right? People who take advantage of that. And, uh, you know, make a vow to God and sow the seed of your money by sending it to me in my TV ministry. And, wow. And then God will bless you. So we got to be careful of those things. All right, good question and uh, a good point to talk about that. Okay, one more thing in uh, Second Peter, and then we'll take a break and look at uh, look at the other four books. Okay, <laughs> excuse me. Peter talks a lot about the importance of the scriptures, and so let's look at these. And so I'd like to get some volunteers to read these because I've been doing all the talking here. So I want somebody to look up Second uh, Peter one. 20 and 21, two verses. Who wants to read that one? I can do that. Okay, I don't see who that was. Chris, was that you? Okay. And then somebody else, the next one on your, on the top of page 153 now, right? 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Who wants to read that? Volunteer? I can do that. All right, Dave, yeah. thank you. And then 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25. Volunteer to do that. I need a third volunteer here. First Peter, learned. First Peter 1, 24 and 25. It's there in the notes there. Okay, Sandy, you got that one? I'll do it. Yeah, okay, that. good. Okay, so let's, uh, Chris, you want to read the first one? It's, uh, it's the, the verse isn't on the screen, but the, what we learn is. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its own origin in the human will. But prophets through human, uh, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Wow. Okay, so these verses we're looking at are all verses about the Bible, about the scriptures. Okay? And so Peter says here that humans didn't write the scriptures, but they were written by the Holy Spirit as he directed those authors, you know, to write. Okay, they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, as uh, Chris just read for us. And that's very important, okay? Now, it's interesting that the Holy Spirit didn't, you know, take over them so that they're like zombies and they're writing like that. No, the Holy Spirit worked through them. The Holy Spirit filled them and inspired them to write. And uh, so you still see, you still see their... Uh, their personalities, you still see their writing styles, you'll still see kind of their experiences and knowledge coming through here, but they were inspired and carried along by the Holy Spirit, you know, as they wrote. Now, okay, so this is week 36 for us. Okay, by the end of tonight, we'll have looked at 65 out of the 66 New Testament books, right? Do, are they all the same? Do they all sound the same? Are they all written in the same format? Do you see the personalities of the various writers as we've been looking at these over the year? No. I mean, it's, it's clear we've got like 40 different authors and uh, just amazing, we think. And, uh, and yet the Holy Spirit is the author behind them, carrying the law, them along. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Who had that, Dave? Okay, yep. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. 
He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them in these letter, in these matters. This letter his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Okay, what does Peter, isn't this interesting? Here's Peter talking about Paul's letters. Wow! Peter talking about Paul's letters. And what does he call them? Peter believed that Paul, as Paul was writing his letters, Paul was writing what? Scripture. Paul, Peter believed that Paul, as he wrote, he was writing the Bible. He was writing the Word of God. He was being inspired by God. I think that's amazing. So, some people have said, you know, all these authors, they didn't think they were writing anything special. They didn't think they were writing anything that was like the Bible, you know, the Scripture. No, that's not true. Peter himself says, here's Paul, and Paul's writings are Scripture. And that some of them are hard, some of them are hard to understand. Anybody who's read through Paul's letters, yes, there are sections super hard to understand. <clears throat> and he says, you know, so three things Peter says here. That Peter believed that Paul was writing scripture. Paul's books are scripture, Paul's letters, inspired by God. Peter says it's possible to distort the scriptures, you know, to twist them, to make them say things that they don't say. And, uh, and if you do that, that brings destruction. You will pay, you know, God will punish and then thirdly, that scriptures are sometimes hard to understand. That Paul's scriptures, he says specifically, are hard to understand. Yeah. All right. Paul writes the same way in all his letters, speaking of them in, in them in these manners. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. All right. Good. Thank you, Dave. So again, we're learning about what the Bible itself says about the scriptures. All right, and then Sandy, the last one, First Peter two or one, twenty four and twenty five. Yeah, as the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. All and right. Word, Good. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. All right. Thank you so much, Sandy. So he quotes, it's great, so he's quoting the Old Testament here, right? Uh, all men are like grass, all the glory is like the flowers of the field, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. All right. God's word, timeless, stands forever. Okay, again, this is an Old Testament quote. Let me see where it's from here. It's from Isaiah 40. I don't know if you want to jot that down beside it. Isaiah 40, verses 6 to 8. Old Testament quote teaches the word of the Lord to stand forever. So obviously, from these various uh, verses we've just read here, Peter had a great respect for God's word. He believed that his readers should have the same kind of respect. That God's word was, well, remember what Paul said to Timothy, that God's word is, that the Bible is God-breathed. And here Peter says that it was the Holy Spirit that wrote it through them as they were carried along by the Spirit. You know, that, that no scripture came about by the will of humans, but it was the Holy Spirit causing them to write. Okay, beautiful. God's word is very important. Uh, let's quickly do this uh, and read through these. So let's have everybody pick one of these to read. So everybody will need to read a second time here. So if you want to pick one around the screen. So 1 Peter 2.2, 2, volunteer. We need everybody to volunteer one. Okay, okay, Kathy. Kathy's got the first one. The second one, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Another volunteer? Okay, Pablo, thank you. Pablo's got that one. 1 Peter 3.15. I can do that. Yeah. Okay, Sandy, get that one. And then Chris, can you do another one? First Peter 4, 7 and 8. Okay, Sandy, yeah, the third one. Chris has the fourth one. Who wants to take the fifth one? Second Peter 1, 8. I'll do that. 
All right, Lex, you take that one, and Dave, then you take 2 Peter 3, 9. And then there's one left, 2 Peter 3, 17. Who wants that one? I can use the last one. Okay, Kathy. All right, Kathy. All right, let's just uh, quickly read through these, then we're going to take our break. So in order, who had the first one? I've got one. Um, 1 Peter 2, 2. Um, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk. So that by it, you may grow up in your salvation. Alright. So now again, he's talking about the Word, the Word of God and learning it, and crave the pure spiritual milk of the words, right? So you can grow up in your salvation, you can grow. Good. Second, uh, second one, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him, who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. Once you were not people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Is that your bird, Pablo? Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, what a great verse. We are a holy priesthood. See, the priest's job was to mediate between God and mankind, right? That was the priest's job. Now, we don't need to go to the priest. We can come, as we've seen in Hebrews last week, we can come right to the throne of God ourselves, right, with confidence. So we're a holy priesthood, a people belonging to God, that we may declare his praises. And uh, so the beautiful. Thank you, Pablo. All right, who's got the third one? I do. Okay. Uh, Fifteen. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life, and if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. All right, so again, this is one to mark, to underline, to put a star beside. This is great. Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect. And I left off the first part, the foundation, set apart Christ as Lord of your life. So when Jesus Lord of your life and you're living for him, people will see it and see and say, wow, there's something, there's hope in your life, you know, and, and always be ready to give them an answer with gentleness and respect. What a great, great verse. All of us, we need to be living that way. Jesus as Lord, the master calling the shots, and then people will see and ask, be ready to answer. All right, next one. First Peter 4, 7 and 8. First Peter 4, 7 and 8. The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and sober, and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Oh man, that's so important, right? Now that doesn't say that you're, you're an enabler. That's not what it's saying. When it says love covers a multitude of sins, it means we just don't jump on each other all the time. Okay, we forgive each other. Now, again, I need to be clear-minded, self-controlled, you know, and so there's not a lot people need to forgive, but... Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. Who's got the next one? We're going to 2 Peter now. 2 Peter 1.8 For if you possess these qualities in an increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, those were those add tos that we talked about before. Thank you, Lex. Who has the next one? Second Peter three nine. Yeah, I do. Thank you, Dave. Uh, three nine. Mm -hmm. uh, three nine. Uh, the Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's amazing. That's God's will of passion. Okay. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Anyone can come to Jesus. Anyone can uh, put their faith in Jesus. And that's what God wants. He's not willing that any should perish, but he wants all to come to repentance. Okay, and then one more. 2 Peter 3, 17. Kathy, do you have that one as well? Yeah, I got it. Therefore, dear friends, since you, are, since you already know this, be on your guard that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless men and fall from your secure position. All right. Very good. Okay, thank you. 317, right? Be on your way, on your guard, so that you won't be carried away by the error of lawless men. 
Okay, so that's the thing. Another warning about false teaching. Be on your guard. Know the truth so that you can recognize the lies. Excellent. Okay, let's take a uh, quick break and we'll come back and look at 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Jude. And again, the last three of them are pretty short. All right, quick break. Five minutes. Come back. The recording has stopped. <laughs> Thank you. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we've looked at 1st and 2nd Peter. <clears throat> now we're going to look at 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the book of Jude. Okay, so uh, let's fill in the chart on page uh, 153, the middle of the page. Uh, by the way, before you do that, here are a couple pictures. So this is a painting of John as an old man who's writing. Now, John, remember, John wrote five books, okay? He wrote the Gospel of John, which we studied with the rest of the Gospels. He writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the letters. And then he writes, we'll see next week, the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And where does he write them? Well, John was exiled onto the island of Patmos. So you've got, here is Greece over here, and there's Turkey over there. And so this island of Patmos, it's still there today. And... <clears throat> Tradition tells us that all of the apostles died martyrs' deaths, except John, who died of old age in exile on this island, this little island. Now, actually, here's a picture of it. This is the island of Patmos there in the Aegean Sea, just off between Turkey and Greece, just off Turkey. And here is the uh, big church that's built over the place. They believe that John stayed when he was on the island that he stayed in a cave, okay? That he was left in a cave. And so this, you can see that people have obviously, you know, uh, set it up and they've got uh, bells and smells, you know, like all the stuff with lamps, oil lamps and everything and tables. And, and so you could go in there and you can visit this place that they say uh, John was exiled here to the island and lived here. And this is where he wrote the Gospel of John the book of the revelation of Jesus and the three letters we're going to look at now. All right, so there he is. Take a good look. That's actually the picture of John taken from a uh, iPhone 12, no, a painting. There you go. All right, so let's look at these letters of John. First, the uh, first letter of John is called the family of God. And all of you old timers, I'm a glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in red blood, cleansed by his blood. Remember, nobody? Okay. That's our five. And the key verse is 512. And that's 1 John 512. And we read verse 13 a minute ago, but 12 says, He who has the Son, Jesus, has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And of course, the next verse we looked at a moment ago. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So that's the kind of life he's talking about. He who has the Son, if you've asked Jesus to come into your life to forgive you of your sins, you have eternal life. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It couldn't be more simple. The date around, the, the key word is know, okay? And we're going to see this over and over in the book. Like, uh, you can know that you have eternal life, you know. And I write this to you who know over and over. 35 times in five chapters, the word know is used. It's the Greek word gnosko. I know so. All right, and then the date is about AD 90. Now, now look at that, AD 90. What does that tell you? What did we just see in Peter? What have we seen in all the letters of Paul? When, when were they? Earlier. Yeah, they were what, 50s and 60s. 60s. Yeah, and this is 90. So John, John knows about, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and so he writes here. And he writes these letters now, like 30 years even further later. All right, and so the key words are no 35 times and the world 23 times. Okay, you don't live like the world, but Jesus died for the world. Okay, but we don't live according to... The world's teaching. 
All right, let's look at 2 John, which is just short, one chapter long. It's a warning against deceivers. And again, remember we said all six of these books talked about false teachers, and the key verse is 2 John 9, it's only one chapter, so verses 9 and 10, let me read those while you write this down. He says, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue on in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. All right. Actually, anyone who welcomes a false teacher shares in his wicked work. Wow. Okay. That's pretty strong. And so the key word is truth. Truth. It's just one chapter. So just once or twice there. Truth. And again, written around 80, 90. 90 years after what they thought was Jesus' birth. Okay, and then 3 John is a contrast of good and bad church members. So I need a couple of examples. Who wants to be the good? Who wants to be the bad church? No, it's a joke. <laughs> so Paul, or not Paul, John here, in this, again, very short one-chapter uh, letter, talks about two different church members, and there's a little contrast between the two. The key word is truth. Again, you've got falsehood and truth. False teachers, the truth about Jesus and who he is, and again, about 80, 90. Okay? Now we're going to spend most of our time here in 1 John, which is bigger and uh, very significant. Everybody got all that in the chart? All right, let's go on. So 1 John is a highlight of the ifs and the nos, and you would have read this for uh, to prepare, but let's quick read through this. Starting at 1 John 1, verse 5. You there? 1 John 1, 5. You got your Bible? Okay. John writes and says this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. Now let me stop you right there and tell you what's going on. Now, I mentioned this in a sermon, like, I don't know if it was last Sunday or the week before, a couple weeks ago, a sermon. Here's this. One of the false teachings by the time of John was called Gnosticism. Okay, Gnosticism. Now, let me, let me write this down. The, the Greek word, okay, so G-N-O-S-T-I-C. Gnostic. The G is silent, Okay. And so the Greek word for to know, K-N-L-W, the word for know is gnosis. And so there, so it means to know. And so, so there was a false teaching going on at this time that had crept into the church that said, and I mentioned this in church a couple Sundays ago, that said that your body, your body is... It's evil. Their body is, is wicked. Your body is sinful. But Jesus saves your soul. So what you, you can do whatever you want with your body because it's your soul that's saved and will go to heaven. Wait, what? It sounds a little bit like the, the prosperity people we talked about a bit ago. Right. No, that, that's called Gnosticism. See, all you, all you have to do is know the truth. You know, here in your body, your, your mind, your soul, and, and there's, there's a special revelation to you. And your body, it doesn't matter. Your body can do whatever you want with your body because your soul is saved. You know, that's like that extreme grace kind of stuff. So this is called Gnosticism. And the word gnosis, you know, uh, means to know, right? And uh, gnosko, I know so, is the way we learned it in Greek class many years ago. And so, so here's what's happening. These guys are saying, I know God, so it's okay if I keep sinning. And that's why Paul is saying, this is the whole passage, now, now catch this. Paul is saying, if you know God, you don't keep on sinning. If you really know God, you stop sinning. Stop saying, I'm not sinning. You are. If you say you don't sin, you're making out God to be a liar because God said everybody has sinned. So that's what's going on. Let's read this. Let's read this again. It says, if we claim to have fellowship with him, but we walk in darkness. <clears throat> you say you're a believer fellowship with God, but you're living in darkness with sin. 
He says, uh, you lie. We lie and don't live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, oh no, it's just my body, okay? We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And listen to this famous verse, the next one. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Purify us. And then he goes to the other side again. But if we claim that we have not sinned, you know, it's just my body, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. Verse chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Stop it. Stop saying it's just my body. So I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. Again, these Gnostics were saying, oh, we know God, we've come to know him. No, then you're sinning. You know you've come to know him when you obey his commands. He says, the man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the word is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. And this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you've had since the beginning. The old command is the message you've heard, Yet I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother, that's one of the sins of my body, hates his brother, is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there's nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness doesn't know where he's going because darkness has blinded him. Okay, does everybody get the idea of that? It's the same thing. It's just my body. That's what they're saying. These Gnostics. Okay? You don't pronounce the G, but Gnostics, if you will. Who said, we know God. Gnostic means to know. No, no, you don't. So what are the some of the their past things that are iffy? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What else is iffy? If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What do we know for sure? If we've confessed our sins, we're purified from our sin and forgiven. Amazing stuff. Those great verses. All right, let's go on to chapter 3. How do you truly love one another? John teaches us here. And there are three important learns verses that we learn. Let's just jot them down here. You ready? Number one, we should love others even when they don't love us. What? Yep. Yep, even when they don't love us, we should love them. 1 John 3.11 This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother, Abel. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil, but his brothers were righteous. Don't be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in heaven. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Okay, that's number one. Number two, we should love with actions more than words. More than we love with words. Let me continue. He says, this is how we know what love is. Whoop, I said that. Verse 17. Uh, this is 1 John 3, 17. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, 
but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in God's presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. All right. So we should love others because Christ loved us. Jesus laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. This is an older King James, so it says brothers. If you, not King James, NIV translation. If you have a new one, it'll say brothers and sisters. But the Greek word is just brothers. So, okay, everybody got that? Okay, let's continue on on page 154 here. This is another interesting passage in uh, 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 to 9. Okay, turn over the page if that's in your Bible, and let's read that. Okay, John says there are three witnesses to Christ. The water and the spirit and the blood testify to Jesus. Okay, let's read. John says, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit, so there's a third one, the Spirit, it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Okay, so what's he saying here? He says there are three that are witnesses to Christ. There is the water. And probably that means Jesus' baptism. Because remember when Jesus was baptized, the, the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove, and the voice of the Father spoke and said, This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. So there's the Trinity right there at Jesus' baptism. The Father, the Spirit, and the Son all together. So there's the water there of Jesus' baptism, at Jesus' baptism, a testimony to Jesus. And then the blood. Okay, the blood, the, the cross is showed Jesus' finished work of redemption. As he shed his blood on the cross, it was to wash away our sins, if you will. So that's a testimony to who Jesus is as well. And then John says, thirdly, there is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And part of the ministry and life of Jesus, uh, well, it was him being filled with the Spirit. The Spirit giving him the power to change the water to wine or to heal the sick, to receive, restore sight, you know, and heal the lame and all those stuff, cast out demons. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. And proof then of his ministry, and when he came, he said, the Holy Spirit will come. He'll be the seal of your salvation. And on the day of Pentecost, what happened? The Holy Spirit came on all the believers, and uh, they spoke in tongues, and it was languages that everybody understood, them praising God, and it was the sign, miraculous sign, that Jesus was who he said he was, the Christ, the Messiah. Okay, good. So three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, testifying who Jesus was. Okay, so that is 1 John, which is great. And again, I don't want you to miss, uh, we're in chapter 5 already, Chapter verses 12 and 13 are so important. Chapter 12, 5, verse 12. He who has the Son has life. Who, he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. What kind of life? Verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. All right. Good, good. Uh, all right, let's go on to 2 John. You ready? We have three more to look at, just quickly, five minutes each. We should be good. We won't even need five minutes each because they're so small and short. So 2 John. Matter of fact, we can read the whole thing, but let's just jot down a couple of things. John is writing to a, a woman, if you will, or a church that he calls a chosen lady. He says, the elder, calls himself the elder, to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who love the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Now you notice that the key word was truth, and now you can see why, can't you? Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. 
All right. So he goes on to warn about false teachers who are trying to lead the children astray, right? As he says to the chosen lady and her children, which most scholars mean it was this certain church, the chosen lady or children, you know, the people of the church that were there. Uh, it gives me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we've had from the beginning. It sounds like John, doesn't it? I ask that we love one another. This is the love, that we walk in obedience in his commands. Have you heard from the beginning? His command is that we walk in love. But here is the false teacher part, verse 7. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. Okay, you know what? I want to do something. I'm going to take a couple minutes and do something else. So these Gnostics, these Gnostics, um, who said that it's only your body, that your spirit is forgiven, and so do whatever you want with your body, this flowed out of their belief that Jesus didn't actually come in the flesh. Okay? That Jesus didn't come in the flesh. That he just sort of appeared and he, he wasn't, he was kind of a phantom, that he wasn't real. So, so would you do me a favor? Go back to 1 John. I know we're in 2 John, but go back to 1 John and the very beginning, because I want you to see this. When you read this, you wouldn't get what's going on, but remember these Gnostics that he's writing to, Gnosticism, have said Jesus didn't come in the flesh. And look what John said. Okay, you're the, everybody there? 1 John 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to you to make our joy complete. Can you? So here are these Gnostics saying Jesus didn't come in the flesh. And John says, no, we saw Him. He was here. We heard Him. We touched Him. He was really here. Do you get the picture? This is right in the face of these Gnostics. And then from there, it's like, if you say you're not sinning, you know, when your body does these things, you're a liar. And if you keep living in the darkness, you don't know God, because he's light. If you keep hating your brother, saying, oh, it's just my body, you know, like, no, we love each other. Everybody got the picture? All right, so that's back to 2 John, and I, I apologize, but I think, I, I think we need to know that. You need to see that, too. But again, he says, many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such, look at this, any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Okay? Denying Jesus that he actually came to earth in the flesh. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded, rewarded fully. Anyone who, this is the theme verse, key verse, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ, meaning that Jesus is God come in flesh, does not have Christ. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. All right. I, I've got much to write to you, John says, but I don't want to use up paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. Now, we don't know if that ever happened, if he was ever released from the island of Patmos, but uh, there he goes. All right, that's 2 John. You got that? So again, verses 10 and 11 we just read teach us to stay away from those who are teaching falsely. Stay away from them. Just avoid them. Ignore them. I mean, in the church, put them out, because you can't have that. But uh, maybe you meet them at Costco, you know, downtown Patmos, Costco. Don't talk to them. There they are, it's theirs. Nope. Avoid them. If you know that they are clearly... Uh, teaching falsely. All right. So that's 2 John. Let's go on to 3 John. 3 John, as we mentioned before, kind of jokingly, is a comparison of two church members. All right. Again, let me read a little bit here. Uh, to my dear friend Gaius. So, so John is writing to a friend of his named Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I love this. I love this greeting. 
Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. Isn't that beautiful? I love that. I pray that uh, you may enjoy good health and that you may that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. All right, so there's a bunch of other stuff that's going on in there. Uh, but let's jump to... Oops, wait a minute. All right, so he says this. Uh, verse... Verse 8. Uh, we ought to show... Uh, all right, verse 5. Dear friends, you are faithful in what you're doing for the brothers, even though they are strangers to you. So some Christians came to them and are teaching. And they have told the church about your love. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such men so that we may work together for the truth. Good. The truth, right? Show hospitality to brothers and sisters as we share the gospel. Verse 9. I wrote to the church, but Diostrophes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. So if I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, gossiping maliciously about us. Not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome those brothers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but it was, but was good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil is not of God. So this guy, Diotrephes, Diostrophes, who some people call him Disastrophes, isn't that cute? Disastrophes, what? He loves to be first. So here's a guy, it's all about him. He's the guy that wants all the attention, and because, you know, John is the only living apostle at this point, you know, and he's writing, he's, don't listen to him, it's me, 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 me. If I come to you, I'll point this out. And, and, uh, and he won't, you know, the brothers that have come from John, he doesn't want to welcome them because he wants to be first. So you've got that guy, diastrophes, disastrophes, wants to be first, nobody else counts. But then, verse 12, Demetrius... On the other hand, okay, Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. Again, he says, I have much to write to you, but I don't want to do it with paper and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we'll talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. All right. So that's just kind of interesting, right? You've got this contrast. It's just one little chapter. And uh, welcome the brothers. People, the pagans aren't going to help them, so Christians need to help the missionaries, the church planters. Christians need to do that. But Diostrophes wants to be first, so he won't do it, won't welcome them. Yikes. Don't be like that. Be like Demetrius, that everybody speaks well of him, including the truth itself. Okay, good. One more book. We'll look at tonight. It's Jude. And everybody always said to him, Hey, Jude. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'll be here till Thursday. Try the veal. All right, Jude. A Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. So, who is Jude? This Jude is Jesus' half-brother, okay? Half-brother. Now, he's, there's another half-brother named James, and we read already the book of James last week, okay? They're both half-brothers. What do they share? A mother, Mary. Mary is the mother of Jesus, and Jude, and, G, and James, and others, and their name, there's a Simon, and, uh, and sisters, but all of them had Joseph as their father. Jesus didn't have an earthly father. The Holy Spirit, remember, overshadowed Mary, and she became pregnant, and uh, so that was conceived in her was of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus had a half-brother, James, we saw last week, and Jude this week. All right, now what do we read? There are just three basic thoughts here in Jude that we want to capture. Uh, one is in verse 6, it's a study of what happens to angels who are disobedient. And this is, I think, interesting, right? <laughs> it says, 
the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, which is heaven, right? These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Okay, so now next week when we look at the book of Revelation, we're going to see that one-third of all the angels, now the Bible often uses stars as a euphemism for angels, one-third of all the angels were swept out of the sky by the tail of Satan. Anyway, Satan rebels, right? The devil, Lucifer, rebels against God, says, I will be on the most with the Most High, I'll be on the Sacred Mountain, I will be as God! And he's cast down, and one-third of the angels followed him. And so Jude tells us here that these angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their own home, these God has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Okay, the great final day of judgment. All right. Which is at least a thousand years away, but a lot of bad things happen between now and then. So that's the first highlight of Jude. Here's the second one, is the idea of perseverance. Let me read that while you jot that down. Verse 17. Dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. Isn't that interesting? Just like Peter talked about Paul's writings and said there's scripture, here's Jude. Here's Jude saying, remember what the apostles of the Lord foretold. <clears throat> Who's he talking about? Well, Peter, John, Maybe Paul, I don't know, perhaps. But they said to us, in the, last times, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you e to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To show others mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted faith. Corrupted flesh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> All right. I love that last part. Be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire and save them, and to others show mercy mixed with fear. Okay, somebody's, you know, somebody's there and maybe they're at the manor, and like, this is a brother, and like, no! Okay, show mercy, but have some fear there too as you walk in, pull them out, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Wow. Wow. All right, and then one more, one last thing tonight is the benediction. The, the close of the book of Jude is beautiful. Now, I learned it in a little song, and I know you all hate this and plug your nose and mute your computers, but let me sing it for you. This is, I think it's beautiful. If you got it, go open there. So let me, let me sing it. <clears throat> From the old scripture and song days of the 1970s and 80s. Uh, now unto him who is able to keep able to keep you from falling and present you faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise god our savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever amen Isn't that beautiful not my singing of course but the the verses isn't that great? Now to him, think about this. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault, because he's forgiven us, and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen? That's just, that's so beautiful. I love that. So this benediction, the close of the book of Jude, is just amazing as well. All right, six books here tonight. Six small uh, letters by other apostles, not the Apostle Paul. And uh, one lesson. But the key thought is this. 
These letters were written by apostles. Why? To prove that Jesus is the Christ and to fight off the teachings of the false teachers who are coming in basically saying Jesus didn't come in the flesh. What? Uh, and that our flesh doesn't matter. Do whatever you want. If you know God, you know, like your sins are forgiven, do whatever you want in the flesh. No, not at all. That's a lie. Okay. Very good. So next week, are you ready for it? Are you excited? Have you been waiting for 37 weeks now? Next week, we will look at the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. So be sure to do the reading. Okay, be sure to do the reading for next week. And because uh, it's, I mean, it's amazing stuff. And yes, there will be a few things that you won't understand, but not as many as you think. And uh, yeah, that's what's on next week. Uh, be here on time, do the reading prepared. And then two weeks from now, on June 16th, we will have the final exam on the New Testament. Now, I, I will send that to you next week so that you'll have a week to kind of work on it. So what we'll do in two weeks is we'll take it up. I, I don't know. We heard from the provincial government about the opening of the pandemic stuff, and we heard that schools are closed, and the current stay-at-home order expired today, but I don't know what the difference is, honestly, because when they say what happens in, you know, on the 16th or the 14th or whatever, you know, with step one, I don't, I don't know what we can do between now and then that's any different, but anyway, so we'll have that final, we'll take up that final exam, and I think we'll be able to have people here. So if we can, we'll, we'll talk next week about uh, that and uh, see whoever can come and wants to come. I'd like to have a little a party with ice cream sundaes or something and see who can bring whatever. And uh, bananas, banana splits work, whatever. I'm good. And, uh, and then we'll take up... Pardon? Boston cream donuts? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Covered with ice cream. So we'll still be online because I know not everybody uh, either can come or is comfortable coming. But uh, next week we'll still be just online. But again, two weeks from today, uh, whoever can come, come. We'll have a little bit of party, whatever. We'll take up the, uh, the New Testament exam and then we'll just take some time answering questions you have about anything at all that we've looked at all year long. And uh, that'll be it. We'll wrap it up. So Revelation next week. And then we'll take up the exam, do questions and stuff the week after. Good? All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you indeed that you love us and you've forgiven us, but you also empower us with the Spirit to live in light, not in darkness. Thank you, Lord, that when we suffer for standing up for you, that is an example to others. It brings glory to you, and we grow even in that process, as Peter told us those things. Help us to know you more and more so that we can identify when there is false teaching that comes around. And in everything, we give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.